Hello, and welcome to the first podcast in a new series called Early Modern Mentalities and Meeting Points, which is being run out of the Warburg Institute in London. As the title of this podcast project implies, over the course of this series, and with a wide range of speakers, we'll be examining the early modern era from an array of different angles, vantage points, and perspectives. But in each case, a priority will be to try to delve as much as possible into the attitudes and casts of mind of our early modern ancestors, who were as culturally conditioned as we are. It will inevitably also mean collapsing the partitions between areas of knowledge that tend to characterize modern academia and mean for a return to a world where its actors saw far few barriers between intellectual domains. And that brings me to today's panel. A major theme being explored in the next 40 or so minutes will be the classical tradition and botany. And we'll be doing so through the multiform prism of mycology, Neo-Latin and art, and in particular, the writing of a 16th century antiquarian, an all-round Renaissance man, Hadrianus Junius. I'm joined by two individuals who met in a rather serendipitous way and collaborated on a project that they have tantalizingly dubbed Stink. Sean Parkinson is an artist, composer and writer based in Scotland. He is currently also pursuing a practice-based PhD at the University of Leeds, where he's an Amanda Burton Scholar at the Centre for Audiovisual Experimentation. The focus of his thesis is the figure of the stinkhorn fungus in relation to sound and smell, hence stink. Dr Caroline Spearing is a classicist by training and now a British Academy postdoctoral fellow based in the English Literature Department at the University of Exeter. Caroline also happens to be a crack Latinist, specialising in particular in Neo-Latin, including the works of the 17th century poet Abraham Cowley. So before we go any further, I'm sure the listeners will be keen to hear more about how this initiative stink came about in the first place. And perhaps, Sean, could you say a few words about that? Yes, so I was, I can be very superficial at times, and my interest of how to connect the senses of of sound and smell in relation to audition, how we listen or hear, sound and and music as a subset of sound. Um, Twinned with my long held passion for mycology and and mushrooms and mushroom identification. I was looking at uh, an identification manual on mushrooms by the the late Roger Phillips. And I was trying to identify all the instances where he mentioned scent as a way of identifying mushrooms. This name, Stinkhorn, and it's very kind of powerful image appeared and I read there's one species called mutinous caninus um obviously kind of named after the uh, you know a, a, a version of priapus but I was interested in about the play of this word stinkhorn versus its its scientific name and how stinkhorn sounds like a musical instrument that would create a a, a, um, a sound that smells and I'm then looking into this and the history of the naming of this mm. fungus. Why in Central and Eastern Europe, um, mycologists, the colloquial names for them, um, persisted on naming it after its phallic shape rather than its smell. So it was a deep dive into that and trying to kind of identify various species of it to see if there are instances where um, smell is made more explicit over the phallic um, visual nature of it and ended up down this alley um, with um, uh, Junius and his writing about the the phallus in the 16th century. And then just reaching that dead end and going, well, well, who else was writing about this beforehand? Because it it does, the image of the the stinkhorn has a curious um, history in botanical illustration in, in the way that it's been printed, 
up, make, you know, printed upside down, reversed again. The naming of it has, has kind of had this strange back and forth. But I, I, I got to this point where this, this story was incomplete and there was an element of this pamphlet that was published in uh, 1564 that hadn't been published, it hadn't been translated, sorry, and it had never been translated directly from the new Latin into English. So I was trying yeah. to find some, I, I gave it my best shot. I was dreadful <laughs> um, and needed somebody with some serious chops. And I was actually put in touch yeah. with Caroline. And it was after a very short conversation that we realized our interest interests kind of vend at this intersection of kind of writing about um, botany, mycology, uh, the ways in which people of that of, of early modern Europe were thinking and speaking and seeing, I suppose, the natural world. So I very much kind of leaned on Caroline at, at that point in my PhD investigation. Great. Thank you, Sean. We might come back to this issue of naming yeah. uh, later on. But uh, Caroline, clearly cue you. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, I was particularly interested in the in Sean's project because my PhD had been on um, a massive and very, very understudied 17th century poem, the Plantarum Libri Sex, Six Books of Plants of Abraham Cowley. Um, and Cowley's writing about 100 years after Junius, but it's a similarly puzzling and enigmatic text for modern readers because it's very, very difficult to pin down. Um, there's poetry about the natural world and quite scientific, botanical, pharmacological poetry. And it's underpinned with um, very learned, detailed footnotes referring to authorities, both ancient and modern. And as soon as I was introduced to Junius's work, I thought this is actually another example of the kind of way that Cowley is looking at the natural world, um, not compartmentalizing it into the creative and the scientific, but actually seeing it in a much more holistic way. Yes. And it, to me, it was very, very exciting that this was evidenced in something that was a century earlier than the Cowley text that I'd been working on. Yeah, fascinating. So a sort of encyclopedic approach to the world um, captured in this Latin text with accompanying artwork. Absolutely. Yeah. And before we see some images that I think Sean is going to show everybody, um, would either of you like to say a few words about Hadrianus Junius himself? Uh, so the author of this piece about the stinkhorn mushroom. Caroline. So Hadrianus was, uh, he was a, a Dutch native. Um, he came from what's now Holland. He was born in 1511. Um, and he died in 1575. Um, he was a great scholar um, and he, he was one of the leading Dutch humanists after Erasmus, who was a, a generation or so earlier than him. Um, he had a fascinating life. He traveled all over Europe. He was absolutely plugged into the Republic of Letters. He corresponded with everybody. He spent quite a lot of time in England, actually, in the 1640s and 50s, when he was tutor, he was physician to the Duke of Norfolk and tutor to his grandchildren, um, which came to a very sticky end when the Duke of Norfolk and his heir, the Earl of Surrey, were both imprisoned in the tower um, and the Duke of Norfolk's library was confiscated. So Hadrianus had to find some other source of income. Um, and he quite shamelessly went round all the crowned heads of Europe, pretty much, um, presenting them with his work and asking for patronage. 
So one of his more intriguing works, which I haven't looked at at all, but hope to at some point, um, was a, a little epic poem for the marriage of Mary Tudor and Philip of Spain called mm. the Philippeian. That sounds very interesting. It does sound very interesting. Indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. So a bit of a hack for hire, but a bit clearly of a ta hire. talented and using his Latin as a way into these circles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the 1550s, he returned to the Netherlands. Um, he became, he settled in Harlem and became a physician and also a schoolmaster. Yeah. Um, and general scholar. Yes. Produced yes. editions, translations of text. Um, probably his, his, the work he would most want to be remembered for um, is his Batavia, which is a history of, of Batavia, which roughly equivalents to, uh, is equivalent to modern Holland. Um, it's a prose text. It, loosely Tacitian mm. um, along the model of Tacitus's Agricola and Germania. Uh, but it wasn't published until after he died because of course at this period, the Netherlands were enmeshed in um, revolt against rule by the Habsburgs. And um, even though Julius himself was, was Catholic, it was felt that the Batavia was kind of, uh, was, con was potentially controversial and sensitive in expressing a kind of Dutch nationalism um, in the face of Habsburg rule. So it wasn't actually published um, until after Hadrianus' death. Well, from all you're saying, this is clearly a really rich oeuvre of uh, an individual, very multifaceted, and worth uh, exploring. But perhaps we can now bring the discussion back to uh, his prose and poem on the stinkhorn mushroom. Um, and uh, Sean, would you like to perhaps briefly summarize the contents of this work? Uh, and perhaps at this point, uh, using some illustrations? Yeah, so uh, one of the reasons that I was kind of drawn to it um, was because of his first-hand account of this mushroom. He, he, he talks about not knowing of any other account previously. Um, so he was obviously very well read, was, was mixing with other people and corresponding with other people who were writing about the natural world, maybe in a similar tone to him. But what struck me about the kind of mixture of prose the woodcut illustration by Martin Hemskirk and the poem was how it gives a complete view of a single species of mushroom. So this has often been cited as the first mycological monograph. So this is something significant. Yes. And he himself is saying he's not found any other reference to this mushroom, this plant that, that he sometimes conflates it with at times. Um, but what I was particularly interested in after we weighed through his introduction and um, some kind of nods to his contemporaries who's he, who he's in correspondence with, we get down in the dirt and he's talking about being in the sand dunes uh, of, of the, the coast of, of Holland, um, which was then um, uh, Batavia and probably Gelderland. Um, and he's talking about this grass called helm, which is marum grass or, 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 or beach grass and which is very spiky and his description of it is very precise um very exact often quite esoteric he he references other animals and organisms and 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 organs as well that that resembles this mushroom um including um sea penises which again requires a quite a you know a, a, an in depth knowledge I suppose of yes. what was was um, present then and what was visible either kind of fossilized or in different parts of the world. But he's talking about what I particularly liked is where he's in the sight of the mushroom. He's being led there by a, a wagon driver I think who's hunting for hares who's been hunting for hares, 
and he unearths these um, fungi for himself. And there's a couple of little glimpses to about how he's examining them. He says, I think there's only two mentions of the, the smell of the mushroom in the prose itself. And he, he talks about how it being so powerful that it can fill the space of an entire room. So we know that he's removed one of these mushrooms to take back to his own home or a, a rented accommodation. It's sprouted overnight um, and that it's filled this room with its stench. Now, I know this because I've done this myself, right? So I found these mushrooms unearthed in the same way as an egg and taken it back to my house to photograph. And even overnight, you can see these things erupt almost in front of your eyes. They're not designed to be smelled in the confines of a home. Their purpose mm -hmm. is to use their smell to attract um, coprophagus and necrophagus flies, so flies that feed off carrion and dung to help disperse the spores of the mushroom, which he wouldn't have known then. Um, so his, his experience with it is very intimate indeed. He talks about taking two samples in what, we, what I assume is a kind of satchel, a haversack, it, you know, in its deepest recesses, he describes. Um, but it's the description of the mushroom and its various parts that I suddenly became interested in. It's about how he unearths it. It's about the color of the flesh of the fungus in its early form, its unripe form, which he described later as a, as a ghost or a demon egg, which even now we colloquially call a witch's egg, um, which parts of it are said to be edible. He's seeing in this object a cool, you know, he, he's finding in this cool slime. And he's kind of, you know, presuming maybe a, a, a pharmacological aspect to it as a treatment for gout. Um, and in, in kind of, you know, contemporaneous text, there's often mention of the application of, of plant matter to, to relieve the, the ailments specifically of, of gout. So he's already kind of imagining, this is the physician's brain. And he's talking about he, how easy it is to take apart this mushroom after it's sprouted, to remove the shaft from the vulva. And already he's kind of mixing up these kind of, you know, the, the, the sex of this thing, which I kind of find really mm. interesting about how he removes the glands or the acorn-like cap. Um, and then he describes the, the, the texture, it being like, um, I think it's the, the, the paunch of an ox, which I kind of assume is, is maybe like tripe. Um, and I think in, in another uh, translation that I've read, describes even the, the innards of a hedgehog somewhere else, I think. So it's very peculiar, really kind of esoteric, but, but exacting. Yes. And Sean, I think you've referred to this as an autopsy. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. So um, the mixture of that and the illustration. Yes. This is a, a mushroom in parts. This yes. is a mushroom in parts and also in, in, in various states of ripeness and over ripeness. So he's yes. got a physician's eye. It is an anatomy. And when we talk about an autopsy, an autopsy literally means the act of seeing with one's own eyes. This is what he's doing. He's doing us a great service. And this is the empirical research we'd expect from, you know, botanists and mycologists that would come after him. So it's the completeness of, of his research in the prose, in the illustration that he's commissioned by Hemskirk and in the poem, which, which I'm hoping that we'll hear a little bit more from. But I'll, if I can just show some images. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, technology won't permit us to reproduce the smell. Um, no. But uh, perhaps we can try to look at this uh, from the perspective of genius. Um, so if you can share your screen. Thank you, Sean. That's great. Look at this a little bit. So here we can see the image that um, Junius commissioned by, by Martin Hemskirk, this beautiful woodcut illustration that was then uh, paid homage to by various other um, um, people like Clunius and Parkinson who came after them, this, this style of illustration. Um, we see on the, the left, the scapus, the shaft, the glands and the vulva, and then we see the complete mushroom. And it, it you know, when you see, this is another species, by the way, um, this is Phallus impudicus. So at the time he, Junius calls this the phalli. Um, 
the phallus. And then we have here the phallus impudicus, the shameless phallus, or the common stink horn, which I'm very familiar with, and in its various stages. Um, we'll, I'm going to come to an image later of the phallus Hadrianae, which was named after, you, you know, after Junius and his initial find. But this is the witch's egg, which is very heavy. He talks about the, the, the density of it, its weight um, and the coolness. It's, it's really precise. The, the vulva, this is when it's just erupted and how easy it is to separate the shaft from the, the egg. Um, and the glands, which is covered in this slime. And it's this slime, this spiracious slime, which is called the gleba, um, which is actually where the smell emanates from. And the smell, I've got to say, uh, is repugnant. It, and, and especially when it's in the confines of a room. And it has this amazing capacity to tease out flies from who knows where. Um, and he gets a few things wrong in his text, which you know is understandable but it's actually, it deliquesces, it becomes, it liquefies very, very quickly. And what it then reveals, as we're seeing in this image, is this perforated, this kind of almost like tripe-like texture, honeycomb-like texture. What you're not really seeing is that urethral hole at the top of this cap, which he talks about as being where the smell emanates from and what the flies are actually attracted to. It's actually this slime that causes the smell and that the flies are attracted to, sometime from several kilometers away, which they feed off. They then um, uh, carry off to other sites um, and excrete. It's got a laxative effect, the slime, and it causes this mushroom to spread in similarly you know, rich soil or sand. So this is the image again. And this is an image of the mushroom named after Junius, which is very common in Holland and some parts of Central Europe, but also I found recently, last autumn, in fact, several miles from my home. So me and my children went out and found this within 10 minutes in the marum grass that grows on the Eastern coast um, of Scotland. And his, the way he describes it, the way he describes finding it, the kind of conditions and the ecology is, is amazingly accurate. The, the old marum grass, um, how it's completely hidden within there, protected like a, a rose growing from a, a, a thorn, a, a thorny bush, sorry. Uh, and the way he describes the color, which you can see is different, this kind of um, lilac color, this violet color. Um, and here it is separated into parts the way that uh, Hemskirk kind of draws it and, and is presented. And even the variations in color that happens um, because it oxidizes when you remove it from the, the sand. Um, so this is kind of an homage to, to Hemskirk and Junius's um, anatomization of the mushroom. And I just wanted to show this at the end because for me, my project um, is inspired by the intimacy and that way of looking at the natural world, how it takes um, one to be very, very close, to know it intimately, and from various aspects, from writing about it, from drawing it, from taking it home, much to the disgust of one's children. Um, this was a commission that I, I made of the fashion designer, Matty Bovan, um, for a performance at Somerset House, who had a show on mushrooms. And although it may not be you know, completely apparent to some eyes, it is trying to speak back to some of the imagery and um, adjectives that Junius and others have used to describe um, phalli, you know, the, the, the species of phallus, of phalli, uh, mushrooms. So I could speak more and, you know, even more about how this has inspired my work, but I think it'd be go good to go back to the Junius text and to talk about how some of the ways- Absolutely. That and thank you so much, Sean. Perhaps we can stop sharing the screen there um, for helping reproduce the experience of someone like Junius. Um, and it really is quite an impressive outgrowth. Um, but uh, Caroline, should we move to you uh, again now? And perhaps you can outline for us the sort of dimensions of this text. So it consists 
of a prose text and a verse text. Um, and the, the prose is significantly longer than the verse. The verse is about 85 hexameters. Um, the, the prose text existed in an English translation that was made early this cent or early in the 20th century. Um, but interestingly, it was actually an English translation of a Dutch translation of the Latin. Um, and the English translation, as I discovered when I turned to it, is fairly elliptical and not completely accurate, um, as you'd expect from something that's being done at two removes. The verse text had never been translated at all. And I find this absolutely fascinating because the reason why it hadn't been translated was that it was regarded as being just too silly and not important or scholarly enough to deserve serious attention. Um, and that was initially why Sean came to me because there was no there was no way into this text for him. Um, when I'd translated the, the poem and found it of such enormous interest, we agreed that it would be worth going back to the to the prose and making an English translation directly from the Latin. Um, and that was a fascinating exercise. The when I started translating the, the poem, I completely fell in love with it. It's just, um, it, it's such a wonderful combination of really, as Sean was saying, really minute observation and really evocative description. I've never been, I've never stood on the Dutch sand dunes, but I know what it would feel like. He, he absolutely pinpoints it. Um, and it actually, as a, a, a digression, it makes me want to read his Batavia because he does have a really strong sense of place. And I, I think uh, his Batavia has been dismissed as, you know, antiquarian waffle. Um, but actually, if it has the same sort of sense of, of place and, and na nation and patriotism that we find in Stinkhorn, then um, you know, I think it it could have a lot going for it. Um, Thank you. And just picking up on a couple of things there, Caroline. Um, is there anything to say about the choice of the medium of verse and also Latin? Well, of course, you have to remember that Latin was how people wrote, um, and it's particularly how people wrote in that international intellectual community that Hadrianus is so much a part of. He's, he's, he dedicates the, the work to um, a Hungarian friend of his called Sambucus. They correspond in Latin, obviously. Um, he talks about correspondence with the great botanist Matthiolus. That's going to be in Latin. Latin is, it is the international language. It's how people communicate. But at the same time, it is, it's also the language of literature. Um, he's writing in Latin, partly because that's how it's going to be read, but he's also writing in Latin because that's how you write poetry. And it's very, very clear, particularly the, the verse text, that he is really plugging that into the classical literary tradition. It, it, it is a classical Latin poem. Yes, and that's very clear, um, even from a cursory read through, that it's very classically freighted. And he's constantly uh, invoking the classical canon, isn't he? And I, I just wonder whether this is because he's attaching himself to a, a tradition uh, and that's how he marks out his own authority. But is it, is it deeper than that or are these classical references rather superficial in a way? I don't think they're ever superficial. I think this is, this is how people 
thought about the world. Yes. Hadrianus's generation learned they often they learned to read Latin before they learned to read their own language. Their education was about reading Latin authors um, and to a lesser extent Greek authors and learning how to write like them. It, it seems rather affected and baroque to us to talk about Thetis being cast on Neptune's golden sands as a metaphor for undersea currents. But to Hadrianus's world, it was completely normal. Those kind of metaphors, those kind of images were just the way you thought about the natural world. And it's, it's as much a part of writing about nature as the minute autopsy observation that Sean was talking about. Thank you. And so well put and a really important message uh, for everyone tuning into this. Just sticking, Caroline, uh, briefly with the idea of the classical tradition, to what extent do you think it is um, causing a sort of obstacle to independent creation? Or on the other hand, is it acting as a springboard for innovation? Oh, absolutely. And there's a tension there, isn't there? There's kind of a tension, but it's, it's, in many ways, it's no more than the tension that an architect feels when they're commissioned to build a house and say, oh God, I've got to build windows and a door. I, I think these, the, the ancient world provides writers of the early modern period with, with stimuli to creativity, with things they can work with. Um, and of course, it, it's, it's as much about changing and alterating and innovating as it is about imitation. You know, I think the, the concept of imitatio has given a lot of this literature a really bad name because yes. when we think of imitatio, we think of slavish imitation, we think of lack of originality. Yes. Being derivative, but actually, um, I think early modern writers thought much more in terms of Seneca's image of, of the bee gathering the honey and digesting yes. it and concocting yes. it, and turn crucially turning turning it into something else. Yes, yes. Thank you, um, Sean. Do you want to pick up on any of those points um, mentioned by Caroline, uh, perhaps in particular about this practice of imitatio. Yeah, so I can speak about a few things and that's partly about my own approach as an artist and a composer and, and particularly this project. I, I'm, you know, I'm not a classicist, I'm not a Latin scholar. Um, I, I'm not a, his, a historian. I'm not a mycologist, I'm, I'm an amateur in all of these things, but I feel that that is often to my benefit because the knowledge that I don't have as an artist, there is a kind of um, freedom to approach people, to bring them into the project should they want to be part of it, that we can learn off each other. The, so the obstacle to creation is a very real one for me in a, in a contemporary sense. Um, in that my inability to be able to access some of these ideas. Um, but this is why um, we as a community now, uh, uh, as a, an intellectual and creative community now, similar to, to then would have corresponded. So I think there's something there about how we share our knowledge and ideas, which is something I see here. The obstacle to creation was overcome by my um, leaning on somebody else's expertise. This concept of imitatio and, and things being derivative in art, it's something we do from a very early age. We, we copy um, where the artist's assistant, that is kind of what they're doing. Uh, they are honing their craft by copying. Something emerges from that. 
originality, authenticity emerges from that. And this is something that mm. in my looking at Junius's text and um, the world of, of mycology, I suppose, and my own contribution to that, which is, which is small, but also how I can imagine one discipline via another, one aspect of the natural world, um, and trying to ignore those obstacles. So for example, um, Caroline said early on um, about not compartmentalizing the natural and the creative view of the world. That these are all one and the same thing. And I believe that what I'm trying to do is to try and um, do something similar where, for example, scent becomes an important part of identification, even though that's not something that can be conveyed easily in text where we rely on language. Um, and my job as a as a artist is to try and reveal some of these things that are hard to to speak about in language right hard, hard to reveal in, in yes. language yes that's why i look to music that's why i look to performance yes um and and at times writing but trying to find it's an adjectival practice i suppose so i'm trying to find ways of, of removing that that's what my music does so i've been working with you know, fragrance designers, um, heritage scientists and chemists, mm -hmm. you know, Latin scholars and, and translators to try and hone in and try and give a complete picture of this single mushroom and its ecology, mm -hmm. and what it means for another kind of cross-modal view of the world that links both now, the way that we are viewing the world now, I, and also links to the past. And I suppose one last thing to say is that this text and this mushroom, which is redolent, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of raison d'etre, is to smell. Um, that's, the, that's the way that it, 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 it manages to, to sustain its, its life. Um, and I feel that it's about those that the ecology and attending to all of the aspects of that that we can try to to really reveal other aspects of our of the the, the world in which we live but also the way that the, the the time at which caroline and i were corresponding was during the pandemic a time which we could probably it's arguable is the most anosmic and um, non-smelling periods um or at least definitely the kind of the, the most kind of uh, enosmic plagues in human history. You know, there's something also about the time that Junius was writing this, that he would have been potentially afraid of the stench of this mushroom. Maybe that's why it's not attended to so much in this publication. Um, the, he talks about the kind of corruption of the, the soil and the sourness of the ground in which fungi grow, which is not correct, but it kind of chimes with other writings about the period, about the, the dangers, the corrupt air theory, the dangers of smells in the air. So that the, I suppose I'll finish by saying the, the benefit of the, of the artist about being able to kind of have that expansive view of the world, I find chimes with Junius's kind of Renaissance attitude, you know, that you talked about him being a Renaissance man. How about some prose? How about some poetry? Exactly. You know, can I speak to about kind of, illustrating this in another way exactly. all i'm doing is is updating that i suppose yeah well said so the mushroom becomes the lightning rod mm -hmm. for the collection the application of a whole range of different disciplines and interests um and i was much struck by what you said there sean about how imitation can actually be authentic uh, and I think so often we associate classical imitation with artifice, as, as Caroline was suggesting earlier. Is it worth just uh, exploring the naming process a little bit? Because uh, Junius's writing is coinciding with a time of huge information proliferation coming from the new world, new species, new phenomena are being, uh, having to be named. Uh, I mean, we all almost have a crisis of language um, in so far as 
new names have to be found for new things. Um, and I wonder if, uh, Caroline, you want to just say anything about that and the, the way in which the classical world is uh, perhaps uh, being plundered for this. Well, it is, it is interesting that he chooses to call it the phallus. Yes. Um, and he, he, he knows it's comical. There is, there is definitely a joke there. Yes. Um, and this ties in, I think, with a related sense of belatedness. He opens both the prose and the verse by talking about nature and how some people might feel that nature has Contrary to what you're just saying, actually, Lucy, nature has stopped giving. Um, that everything, all the gifts of nature have been observed and recognized and classified, and there's nothing left. Mm. But, says Junius, actually, there's this mushroom. Um, and the existence of the mushroom shows that nature's nature is is the gift that gives on giving yes he hasn't yes. he hasn't run out so there's this there are lots of things going on here there's the sense of coming at the end uh, almost the 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 mushroom is is kind of the last thing left over almost like hope in the bottom of pandora's box um so there is there's something inherently different and odd and perhaps something something slightly funny about it. It's also, I think, interesting that it grows in Hadrianus's native land. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there's definitely a sense of, of patriotism. Yes. But so what I think, it, uh, there's this very, there's a sense of anomaly, of, of oddness and oddity. And Hadrianus is playing up the suggestive shape of the mushroom, kind of as a way of emphasizing that that incongruity and strangeness. Um, and he, you know, he doesn't shy away from it. He says he's calling it the phallus after the the phalloi that um, were worn in Greek comedy. Um, he conflates the custom of ritual phalloi with the idea of the, the, her, the herms yes. used as boundary markers. Um, so he's very much rooting it in the classical tradition. Um, and then he ends the poem with this wonderful made up origin story of one of the followers of the god Priapus who was renowned for his enormous phallus. One of these followers is pursuing a nymph um, she eludes him. Um, it's all too late. He ejaculates, and the outcome is the the mushroom. And, uh, and of course, this is derived from one of the foundation stories of Athens. But he's reworking it and reinventing it to his own purposes. Um, and that you know. He knows he knows what he's doing. It's it's a it's a game. Yes. It's a joke. It's yes. a show of three. But yes. at the same time, it is it is rooted. Yes. It's very it's serious, precise scientific observation. Yes. And myth, of course, is bound up with etiology and just another way of explaining how something came into absolutely. being. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Yes, so he, he begins with this really precise um, empirical description. Yes. And he ends with, with a myth that's not, it's not even a scholarly antiquarian Greek myth. It's a myth yeah. he's made up. Yes, yes. Um, and I suppose therein lies the nature of myth. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, 
Sean, I don't know uh, in the final minutes of, of this podcast whether you want to mention briefly the, to our eyes, very sexualized um, anatomical language that's being used. Um, and I, I, I note from one of your articles, uh, you mentioned that this work uh, is is in many ways, reminding men of their own penises. Um, but, uh... I mean, it, it, it is impossible to escape that. You know, we are yeah. a very kind of visual centric um, species ourselves. Um, so we, we name things mostly by how they look rather than by how they smell or even how they sound. Um, so there is, I mean, this is what, it, it becomes really stark when you see one in the flesh, um, it's phallic nature. But also there is something about when one, ha when one has uh, the misfortune to, to be so indulgent by taking one home and, and let, letting one erupt in one's home to kind of photograph, the smell also reminds, it's, it's of bodily functions. It's also been described as having a spermatic scent, which Phallus hadrianae definitely does over Phallus impudicus for example. So there are subtle shifts in the way that they smell. So perhaps all of this was kind of entering his psyche even then. I don't know. Entering his imagination. Um, but it does have a curious history that, of, of naming um, that has all been these kind of finaring uh, men, um, tongue-in-cheek. Um, for example, it was named um, after Hadriana, the Hollander's working tool um, this tool being, you know, a euphemism for, for a penis. Um, so a lot of that proliferated until he's paid homage by this Dutch stinkhorn um, being called Phallus Hadrianae. Hadrian's, you know, Adrian's Phallus, you know. And I th there's been um, discussion later on, the British Mycology so Society, for example, the, the author E.C. Large, Put forward, a, uh, put forward an argument in his annual address, arguing that we should dispense with the, the Latin scientific um, binomial names that we give fungi in favor of some more fun um, names for mushrooms that, that can be spoken by children. And he names the stinkhorn as one of them, stinkhorns and puffballs. But there is, of course, a reason why we have the, the, the scientific binomial naming, because it allows us to distinguish between species that look almost identical. Um, but buried in there, there is an element of poetry. That's what I enjoy. It's about attributing things that, uh, about, for example, even, even um, Helm, the marum grass, which we see the, the Phallus hadrianae, the June stinkhorn poking up through is it mean its Latin name means sand loving. It also is what binds the sand together to form dunes. It then allows the stinkhorn to grow. The sand loving grass, the you know, Adrian's phallus poking up through it, all of these things, as Caroline talked about, it begins with the empirical analysis. It ends with myth making. And I really enjoy that. I'm I'm very much part of the the latter, the myth making. Well, thank you, and that's a wonderful note on which to uh, conclude this podcast. And it's been a model of the best kind of academic cross fertilization. Um, and I so appreciated you sharing these stimulating and very penetrating insights. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>